Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilland, and the uh, co-founder of Visionary Wealth Advisors. And today, I have the privilege of interviewing Frank DeAngelis. Frank, how you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited. For those uh, people that either follow me on social media or listen to the uh, podcast, they got to hear Tommy Spalding, your good buddy, my new friend, uh, talk about your story and amazing how things happen. Tommy introduced the two of us, and now here we are a week or two later, and and we're chatting. So very, very thankful for that. So uh, maybe for the people that don't know who Frank DeAngelis is, before we dive into kind of the, the, some of the stuff we'll talk about today, kind of what's made you the man you are today, Frank? Oh, I look, I think the person I am today uh, had a great support system growing up. Uh, my mom and dad, and I'm blessed they're still alive. Uh, my dad's going to be 90 and my mom's 86. And a lot wow. of the things that I learned back then, uh, I owe to them. And yep. They raised me well and uh, grew up in uh, an Italian community, the blood of Italian, and uh, I, uh, Italian immigrants were down there, and the church was very important to us. And so, yeah, look back so, on it now, and they really have, uh, I owe a lot to them. What uh, what part of the country did you grow up in? I, I was in Colorado. I'm a okay. One of not many of us left, but been here my entire life. And yeah, my mom and dad are still here and I'm my brother and sister. So very blessed. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, we'll dive in, Frank. I mean, that uh, probably everybody listening to this remembers the uh, the date of April 20th, 1999, the first school shooting uh, here in America, Columbine High School in Colorado. Uh, you were the principal there. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate now we have more and more of these things happening, but at that time we did not. And I think your story and what you've de- done since then is very heroic. So hats off to you and thank you for the leadership with those kids. But kind of walk us through that day, if you could. Maybe, you know, that morning, obviously, you woke up, weren't thinking this was going to happen, but just kind of maybe some of the story behind that. Yeah, it, it was a beautiful Colorado spring day, about 70 degrees. And it's real interesting because um, I was a principal. I had a very difficult time deciding to leave the classroom. And I had uh, several people said, boy, you should think of becoming an administrator. And friends of mine are saying, why would you want to go to that dark side? <laughs> I'm one of them. Right. And one of the things I loved about my job was the kids. You never had a bad day with the students. And I was one of the few high school principals. I loved cafeteria duty because I got to talk to the kids in a very informal setting. And so each day I was down in the cafeteria. Well, on this particular day, I wasn't there uh, when school started. I started out at a conference or a meeting actually with some students, our future business leaders of America. They were being recognized by uh, community members. And so I went to the breakfast. And so I arrived late to school. And usually I'm down in the cafeteria. We had two lunches, A lunch and B lunch. And Mm. I was always down there for A lunch, about 700 people down in that cafeteria. But I was in my office offering uh, a new teacher a continuing contract. And before I could offer him the contract, um, he still has a job. But I don't know if we ever offered a contract. My secretary, Susan White, comes in and said, Frank, there'd been a report of gunfire. Well, oh. that did not register. I mean, I had been a part of that community for 22 or 20 years. I could count on two hands a number of fistfights or any acts of violence or things of that nature. So I was in shock. And I went through something that day that I've learned later was fight, flight, and freeze. And what I actually did and what I was perceiving were two different things and went through something known as sensory stimulation and everything just seemed to slow down. And I can remember coming out of my office and then my worst nightmare became a reality. About 75 yards down, I saw a gunman coming towards me and a baseball cap turned backwards, a white t-shirt, cut off t-shirt, black vest. And I thought I walked out very calmly, and the teacher, Kiki Leva, said he could not believe his eyes. I ran right towards the gunfire. Mm. And I've, I've had police officers say, Frank, you're unarmed. Why would you do it? One reason, I had some of my students that were in danger. We had 30 girls uh, that were coming out of the locker room to go to a physical education class. They were unaware, and they were just in the crossfires. And so I was able to run towards them. and. I felt that if I can get him in the gymnasium and lock the door, then we had exits outside to get him outside because there was a report of bombs exploding and plan was going perfectly, trying to keep the girls calm. But all of a sudden I pull on the gym, gymnasium door and it's locked. Oh and no. 
and girls are screaming. We actually hear the boots on the ground of the gunman coming towards us or coming around the corner. The sh sounds of the shots are getting louder. And something happened that I uh, just can't explain, but I'm glad it did. I reached in my pocket and I had 35 keys on a key ring. And I reached in my suit pocket, pulled it out. First key I pulled out, I stuck it in the door and opened it on the very You got to be kidding me. And I still get chills when I think about it because and it wasn't that this key was specially marked. It was just mixed in, reached in, stuck it in. And as the doors closed, the gunman's coming around that corner. And so um, it was pretty emotional. Last year was a 20 year remembrance and had many of the, invited the students from the classes of 1999 to 2002. And many of the girls that were with me that day came to see, you know, their classmates and kind of a, reunion type of thing and many came up to me and they were crying and I started crying they said you know Mr. D thank you for finding that key because if you didn't find that key I wouldn't have my family here with me and it just really hit home and I said I had very little in doing with finding that key you know yeah and after a second you can't say somebody wasn't in charge of that one right that's exactly right it wasn't me yeah. So, so you guys get this key, you go in this door. What, what happens then? The gunman comes around the corner, uh, doesn't come follow you or what happens? Doors, I was able to lock the doors behind me. And one of the things that I did is I told the girls and I put them in this storage area where they uh, stored athletic equipment, uh, gymnastic equipment. And I said, I promise I am going to come back to get you, but I wanted to make sure it was safe because the intel, intel that was coming in from the police said there were snipers outside and I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to run into an area of danger. So I ran, locked them inside, inside the door, and I went outside, stuck my head out, and that's when the police started arriving. And I said, I need to go in and get my girls, uh, the students. And so I went in, the police officers covered me, and then went outside. And you're communicating, sorry, through like a CB or something you've got that you just happen to have as the principal of the school? Uh, and I'm talking and all of a sudden I police said no one's going back in and the thing that's really interesting and we've come such a long way since then back there the protocol at the time was secure the perimeter so we actually had a police officer a school resource officer Neil Gardner who was exchanging gunfire but he was being told along with many of the arriving law enforcement they couldn't go in the building until the SWAT team arrived hmm. and so, and they weren't going to let me go back in so I went out with the girls, took them out, and we went to the park, which was really the state place where all the police officers, um, firefighters were mobilizing. And it was at that point that I had started helping them. And it was interesting because back then, 20 years ago, they didn't have the floor plans on computers. They actually took me to a whiteboard and they're having me draw the floor plans of the science wing. And I was in a state of shock. Oh, yeah. And they're saying to me, you know, Frank, do you know how the exit doors, where they are? Then they, at one point they said, can you draw the ventilation system? Oh. That's when you get, I mean. Again, yeah, like, like you know that, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and then it got to the point, the fire alarm was so loud because the fire alarm had been pulled that you and I couldn't carry on a conversation. As a matter of fact, that was a great hindrance when uh, the officers got into the building. But they said, Frank, we're getting ready to send the SWAT team in. It's loud. Would you be willing to put on body armor to go in the building to shut off the fire alarm? And so I'm getting ready to go in. And then the commander said, no one's going in that building until the SWAT arrived. And so that's what happened. And it was there that um, my life did change forever. Yeah. So walk me through that. When they, when they look you in the eye and they say, will you put on body armor and walk in there? And your immediate answer is yes. Why is that? As educators, that's what we do. That's what we do for our kids. Uh, there's a principal at Sandy Hook, Dawn, who threw herself in front of her little first graders to protect them. And, you know, as educators, and people ask me, you know, would you do it again? As a matter of fact, th there are so many things that have changed. You know, back in the day, the only drills we did were fire drills. Now they're doing all kinds of emergency yeah. drills and lockdowns. But uh, I had someone from the school district say, Frank, we have this protocol and you're going to be the incident commander. And I said, with all due respect, if it happened again, I'm not going to be sitting in my office giving directions. I'm going to go to where the kids are. And yeah. I think as educators, that's what we do. And, you know, they're all of our kids. And yeah. I would do it. A, a, yeah. What's, so I'm, uh, I grew up in a town called Mattoon, Illinois, and there was a school shooting there a couple of years ago. And 
I don't, I don't know this lady. She wasn't there when I was there, but, uh, from what I hear, I think, uh, math teacher, maybe, um, you know, a hero, right? She jumps in front of that, moves the person's arm and nobody was, was killed. Right. And, and you think just the courage, right. That it takes the normal everyday person, like the rest of us to jump in front of that and risk their life. I don't, you can't teach that. I don't think, do you, do you think you can? No, it's tough. You know, you can do all the drills possible, but until you're in that situation, you don't know. And for me, the instinct was just to go. Well, I knew yeah. my students were in trouble. You know, I, I, I was a leader of that school, and this is something I have to live with for the rest of my life, is survivor's guilt. I mean, those kids walked into my building at 7 a.m. Mr. Sanders, who's one of my dearest friends, walked into that building, and they never returned home. And I found out later that if Mr. Sanders would have stayed in the faculty lounge that day, we probably wouldn't be doing this interview because I would have been dead. And what I found out, later which added to my grief was the fact that he came up the hallway at the same time the gunman was coming towards me and the girls and temporarily the gunman turned around and unfortunately shot dave through the back of the neck and through the head and he later died from that so there's again one of those things saying you know if dave wasn't there there's a good chance i would have died along with those 30 girls gosh Lots of questions here, but so talk to me about that grief. So you, st- you, you call it survivor's guilt. And I'm sure that was for, you know, it's been 20, it'll be 21 years this April, April 20th. How, what was your, your, your surroundings with, I mean, with people, with, with loved ones, with family, with counselors, right? What was that process like for you to get over that? So if you're and I'm, and I'm asking that for the person that maybe listened to this, that dealt with grief or is dealing with grief, grief at a high, high level, How can you help them understand there is a light at the end of the tunnel? The most important thing, and, you know, every year I uh, I do presentations around the country, and and what I tell people is no matter what you go through in your life, and hopefully none of you have to go through a Columbine, it's not a competition who suffers more, but basically you don't have to travel that journey alone. And for me, um, I'm a cradle Catholic. My faith is really important to me. But for the first time in my life, uh, that evening, I couldn't go back to my house because they were concerned about the safety and welfare of my family. And I was at my brother's house, and I was questioning my faith for the first time, saying, God, you know, how could you allow this to happen? What I witnessed, kids being shot in the face, um, you know, identifying these kids. And it was two days later, Father Ken Leone, who was the pastor of the parish that I had been a member for 20 years, St. Francis Cabrini, called me down. And I said, Father, I don't have time. He said, he said, Frank, you need to come down. And I'll never forget that evening. There was about 1,200 people in the sacristy. And he called me up on the altar, along with some of the students that were part of the youth group. And he whispered something in my ear. And he said, Frank, you should have died that day. If God saved you, now you got a plan. Now you need to go out and rebuild that community. And he hmm. told something that I remember to this day. It's Proverbs 16, 9, stating, you know, a man can plan his course, but the Lord determines his steps. He said, many times, he said, many times, difficulties are really blessings in disguise. And he said, Frank, you got to remember this. You've got to live by faith and not by sight. Hmm. You're going to question things. So that faith piece was so important for me. And as I tell people, If you're not a believer, I'm not trying to convert anyone, but find that support system. And the next thing that's vitally important is the counseling piece. Because I talk to people that, you know, people told me, well, if you seek counseling, that's a sign of weakness. I said, no, it's not. I said, it's a sign of strength. And probably one of the key points in getting getting me where I am today was that counseling piece. My mom worked for a Vietnam veteran. John Fisher, and he was a chiropractor. My mom worked for him, and he called me within 24 hours. He said, Frank, you're going to find every reason not to seek out help because you're going to be trying to help the parents, the kids, community members, but if you don't help yourself, you can't help anyone else. And so the analogy I use is next time when we get on a plane and that flight attendant comes and states if this cabin loses air pressure, a mask is going to drop down. Yep. Before you help that child, before you help that elderly person, you need to put it on yourself. And so if I did not have the counseling, uh, I would have never been able to continue to fulfill what Father asked me to do. Yep. But I think, and that's such a great point in the airplane analogy, but it doesn't feel right because, you know, I've been on planes with my four children, right? And it's like, 
I want that kid to be okay, but it's counterintuitive because I got I do have to take care of myself. So wouldn't you say as a leader though, it's hard to do that. And it was, it was really hard to do. You put everybody before, but right after I saw things that were going in my life, my life had changed forever. And people ask me all the time, when does it get back to normal? And it doesn't, we had to redefine what normal is. And, and I'll tell you, I had a lot of anger uh, right after a lot of hurt, reoccurring nightmares, not eating. And here I was going to be responsible for rebuilding that community. And, you know, all eyes were on Columbine and I realized yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole country, I had to take care of myself, not only physically, but emotionally. And, and my counselor gave me the steps. You know, when people say to me all the time, and, and I understand this, they'll say, well, I have my husband, I have my wife, I have my spouse and friends, and we have a great relationship we can talk. And I said, that's wonderful. But let me pose this question. If you broke your arm or if you broke your leg, would you allow your wife or your husband to fix them? They said, well, no, that's crazy. And I hmm. said, why would you not talk to someone professionally? And they'll say, well, I couldn't find that person. Well, reach out to them. And I got to tell you, 20 years later, 21 years later, when I hear about these other shootings, whether it be Parkland, Santa Fe, we had one in Douglas County, it takes me back to that day, even though it's 20 years later. And I learned something from them. Uh, it's called a touchstone. And I, I have some medals around my neck. And so when, when I start getting phone calls or texts, people are saying, you're in my thoughts and prayers, thinking about you. Within five minutes, the media is calling because they want my input to help. Well, my heart starts racing. It takes me back. Mm. But now what I end up doing is just grabbing these medals around my neck and just stating, you know, this is not April 20th, 1999. This is February 14th, 2018 with Parkland. And it helps me to get where I need to be. So if I'm going to continue to help people, I need to be able to help yeah. myself. So basically what you would say then is that it doesn't go away. So that person that may be dealing with grief or anxiety or stress, depression, it doesn't necessarily just go away. It's how you deal with it and become, make it an ally and not an enemy. Is that a fair way to look at it? Very much so, you know, and just looking at myself, I had been, I've been in six car accidents in the month of April and I'm not texting, but <laughs> early on in my career, I would dread, and you talk to people that were there, the people that survived Columbine, they, they did not want to see April coming around because it would elicit these feelings. And so what I ended up doing, knowing when April came around, is I called it maintenance. I went and talked to my counselor. He got me ready for the month of April. And I'm more vigilant when I was driving and things of that nature. And it's not that you can't get over it. But you, there's these steps and you have to replace things. And here's a simple thing that I learned when I, when I went back in the building and I went back July 4th because we could not go back into Columbine right after. We had to finish over at Chatfield because the, the building was a mess. Oh, that. I went back probably eight weeks before the teachers and students. So the first week or so that I walked in that building, I had flashbacks and I'd walk out of the, my yeah. office and I would visualize that gunman coming towards me. There were construction workers and there were loud sounds. I would literally, oh. I went to my counselor and he said, Frank, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you're going to continue to be the leader of that school, when you walk out of your office, if all you see is that gunman and you hear those loud sounds, if all you envision is shots being fired, your career at Columbine is going to be short lived after moving forward. He said, but what we got it, what we need to do is change that mindset. And he literally said, Tell me about Lauren Townsend, one of the girls. She was a volleyball player, an, an, an A student. Well, tell me about Rachel Scott. I remember two weeks prior, she was on the stage performing. Well, tell me about Kelly Fleming. I used to see her down at church. You need to change that mindset. So when you come out of that office, you see Lauren Townsend playing volleyball. You see, Rachel Scott, instead of mourning their death, you need to celebrate their lives. And that's one of the things that I tried to share with the people is to build upon the positive and not dwell upon the negative. Mm. And that's so profound. And, and you think about it, it's, it's, much, it's much harder than why you just said it though, right? Oh, it, there were things, I, I mean, things that you never envisioned. You know, in 20 years of education, you know, with my degrees that I had, I'd never 
was prepared for this day. Simple things, we had parents who decided to put an archway of balloons up, blue and silver balloons, our school color. Great idea until the balloons started popping. Kids mm. started popping. You know, things of that nature. We could not serve Chinese food at Columbine for three years because that's what the kids were eating. Oh, school. wow. I mean, things that you never think about. And now, one of the things that I do, again, I'm not an expert, but I can share my experiences with some of these other communities that are out there. Yeah. And um, it was interesting. It was last year, there's this organization called the National Association of Secondary School Principals, and they invited me to head up a group called the Principals Recovery Network. And they brought me along with 21 other principals or administrators who had experienced shootings at their schools. And what we're trying to do is have this network come up so when it does happen we could reach out and you know recently we had a shooting in San Clarita so I've been talking with the principal there Vince Ferry and I helped with Parkland and you know I made a comment probably within a week of our tragedy I said I just joined a club in which no one wants to be a member hmm. when I do call them it's amazing they'll pick up that phone you know yesterday was the uh, two-year anniversary of a shooting at Marshall County Patricia Greer is a principal there. I just called her to check in to say, how are you doing? You know, and that type of thing. So we can yeah. take another. Wow. So I think I guess we'll go there now. I was going to talk about that, that kindergarten class that Tommy Spalding painted so eloquently the, the story behind that, that led us to where we're at today. Um, one, Tommy thinks the world of you, right? And talks about being a heart led leader and, and love and, and especially as a man, right? To be able to talk about love and transparency and vulnerability. Um, but you were really vulnerable and very transparent with this kindergarten class a few weeks after it happened, right? And so share with our listeners that story if you can. I realized, you know, there were people deeply impacted by the shootings at Columbine. Of course, the 13 families who lost their lives and the kids and all of their friends, we had 24 who were injured. But there were others impacted. All those kids in elementary school, uh, our community was overtaken by people that came to the park where a makeshift memorial was set up. Uh, Leewood Elementary in particular was our reunification center. And there were kids down there that saw these high school kids being bused down there, parents crying, and they were impacted. And again, referring back to Father Leone stating, you know, you got to rebuild that community. I knew it wasn't going to happen. We weren't going to wake up someday and everything was going to be back to normal. And I made a decision. Originally, we were talking about, let's make a promise. When I met with the staff in the aftermath, I said, let's make a promise to be here until 2002. Let's just make that commitment because that'll be the class of the freshman class. And if we decide we want to move on, and for me, I still had a good 10 years before I could even think about possibly retiring. Yeah. So we made that commitment. But again, doing some self-reflection, I said, I can't do that in three years because I need to make sure that everybody that was impacted by that, and that would be the preschool or kindergartners. And that's when I made that commitment to stay. And mm. so I said, I will be, I promise you, I will be your principal handing you your diploma and I want you to be there at Columbine High School. You're going to help us rebuild that community, you know, one step at a time. And it was interesting. I was getting ready to retire in 2012 and everything was going as planned. And all of a sudden a parent calls and said, Frank, uh, you can't retire. And I said, well, I made that commitment, you know, the class of 2000. I said, no, you don't understand. My kid was in the first year of a two year preschool program. <laughs> Hey, now wait a second here <laughs> well it, was, it gets even more interesting I had a parent come up to me and she said mr d do you remember me and you know i wasn't the smartest principal i wasn't the tallest principal i'm a short italian guy <laughs> as far as loving kids i loved them and it was interesting so this girl comes up to me and i was very good at remembering names and classes and she said do you remember i said yeah you're in my you graduated 1983 you're in my history class she said we are so thankful. My husband and I, you know, we were students of yours and now you're a principal here for my daughters and we just want to thank you. And I said, oh, you're so welcome and I'm glad we're part of this. We've been through you know, so much together. And so she's pushing a stroller and I said, 
that is so cute. Is that your granddaughter? I said, no, that's my daughter. Can, can you stay until 2025? And I said, <laughs> I'm I'm drawing the line here. <laughs> yeah, I got to stop, you know. Uh, but uh, it was the right thing to do. And so I really felt when I walked away from Columbine that I had fulfilled that promise that I made on April 24th to father and those yeah. kids. And I was so proud of them. And as a matter of fact, when I addressed the classes from 2012 to 2014, I said, thanks for believing in me. Thanks for being a part of this because I watched you grow up. Literally, hmm. it was such an honor to be giving you this diploma today. Well, I was giving my question. What was the emotion like when those kids are walking around and you're handing them that diploma and you know that maybe tomorrow you're going to retire? What was that like? My last graduation was so emotional. Um, as I'm sitting on stage, I think back to the first day I started at Columbine, you know, I was 23 years old and going to be 60 when I retired. And it was just a day that even though I was looking at the class of 2014 flashing before my eyes, because I, I was at 35 graduations as a teacher and as principal and just flashing and I, my mind just flashing through all of those kids that were there. And I impromptu, impromptu took a selfie and I mm -hmm. took off the stage and they were surprised. They said, gosh, you're 60 years old. You when know, you I started, they weren't doing selfies, were they? Yeah, 30, 37 years ago. <laughs> and so it kind of eased the tension. And then to my surprise, um, right before I got up to speak, President Obama had sent a letter. Uh, thank wow. you for my years of service. And so the crowd went crazy, but it was a very emotional day. And, uh, you know, a lot of tears, a lot of tears of joy, but a lot of tears of sadness. Yeah. Because, um, it, it did take me back to those years between 1999 and 2002. Yeah. One in particular, uh, Lauren Townsend and uh, Isaiah Schultz were seniors at the time, and they were set to graduate in 2000, and, or excuse me, 1999. And I can remember at graduation, Lauren Townsend was a valedictorian and her mom and dad came up and I can remember giving them the plaque and taking a picture and uh, that emotional thing and uh, to where we were today. Yeah. So the name Patrick Ireland, does that sound familiar to you? One of my yeah. friends. Yeah. So I, uh, I used to work with Patrick. I was in St. Louis and, you know, obviously he's out in Colorado and I've heard his story a few times and here's a kid that was shot. And the gunman, from what I remember, was standing over the top of him and kind of straddling him, looking down with a gun. And he had to play dead, right? I mean, you think of the courage for some of these people. He was the one, if you obviously you remember, but for our listeners, that famous picture, uh, unfortunately famous, where somebody's coming out of the window and the guy standing on top of, I think it was an ambulance, if I remember correctly. That that guy was Patrick, right? And Exactly. Just those stories of just courage that you know you shouldn't have to have as a kid. And I got to share something about Patrick. Uh, he lives about a mile from me. Okay. He, will you tell him I said hi? I will do it because we're getting ready. We're going to do a presentation together in a couple of months. But we just had dinner with his mom and dad. But he was such a brave kid, and I was really throwing myself a pretty big pity party after you know why me da 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 da. Yeah, sure. When I became what helped me so much is we had four kids that were critically injured, Patrick Ireland, Sean Graves, Richard Costello, and Anne-Marie Hall Coulter. And I would go to the Craig Hospital where they were rehabbing. And when I walked out of the hospital on Saturday, I'd go over there every Saturday to visit the four. I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. Patrick Ireland, who was a straight A student through his junior year, couldn't even put three words together and make a sentence. And the rehab was, the rehab that he had facing him was just monumental, but he never gave up. He was an inspiration. He is someone who told me as a 17 year old kid, he said, Mr. D, I'm not a victim. I'm a victor hmm. that I cannot start healing until I forgive. And I can remember he graduated the following year as the valedictorian after a year of intense rehab. Uh, he ended up going to Colorado state university, graduating the top 10%. And I can remember he invited me to his wedding and um, hmm. you and uh, Kenny Hosack, who was the director at, uh, over at the hospital, tapped me on my shoulder and he said, and he was crying, I started crying, he said, did you ever think when you were walking to Craig Hospital that you would ever see Patrick walking down the aisle to marry that beautiful bride? And he's got three kids, he's my financial advisor, and I'm so glad Patrick's doing well. It's so, so awesome. He is Love it.
I've that. heard him tell that story in front of about, oh, you know, 10,000 of his closest friends. And it was, I don't think there was a dry eye in the whole, uh, the whole auditorium. I mean, a great student, but what a great father and a great yep. husband. And he's so well respected. Yep. Amen to that. Well, how's Frank D'Angelo's doing today? Fantastic. I couldn't be happier. Uh, my lovely wife, my high school sweetheart, uh, have a granddaughter, Mia Isabella, who I love dearly. Uh, she started kindergarten. I get to volunteer and life could not be better. And, you know, I, I'm failing retirement. I, I need to figure <laughs> out a little bit, but uh, I'm so blessed. And, you know, out of every event, you decide what's going to come out of it. You know, I had, I, I say this, it, you know, it, that's all right. <laughs> in our lives, no one ever calls on the landline yeah exactly right but now they do that's quite all right we totally understand that we have to have it because uh, we live in an area that phone service is not always best okay anyway you can't determine what happens to you but you can determine your response Hmm. and you know and i really felt in my life and you know tommy and i are dear dear friends he's one of my dearest friends and we talk about this each and every day, and we're both people of faith. Uh, every morning I wake up and I read Bible verses, and for the past like probably six years, I send Tommy a Bible verse. And, I think Tommy said he says he hears I love you from Frank before he hears it from his own wife. Well, Tommy, <laughs> my dearest friends, and he always knows when to call. And, uh, you know, what brought us together, and I see your St. Louis ball cap, so uh, right. I'm sure about that. <laughs> We're hoping to get your third baseman here soon, but no, that's a whole nother podcast. Not ugly. Uh, but we ended up, uh, Tommy and I are Yankee fans. And so, okay. So, but Tommy is one of the nearest, dearest friends, and his kids are just fantastic. And it's, it's fun watching them grow up. And, um, yep. and so, you know, out of tragedy came so many wonderful things, meeting great people. I got an opportunity to meet you, uh, yeah. you know, and Tommy and others. And so I'm blessed for that. And, you know, I go out each and every day, and one of the first things I do before my feet hit the ground when I wake up is I recite the names of the 13. And hmm. I promise that I, there's nothing I can do to bring them back, but I'm going to promise them that they'll never, ever forget you. And when I do my presentations, um, I have a picture because I'm nervous. I don't care how many presentations. Yep. I'm nervous, and, and that's good. People say you should feel some and not you know, butterflies. But Absolutely. It was like have a picture of each of the 13 and I recite their names individually. And all of a sudden there's this calming presence that comes over me and I just look up and say, hmm. I'm curious if, if you got some more time here, I'm curious on a couple things. So, so almost every episode on the circuit of success, I talk about fear and I asked a question like this. I'll say, Frank, of all the fears you've put in your mind, how many of the fears have actually blown up to the magnitude you put them in your mind to be? Okay. Most people respond with, you know, ha, none of them, right? We put so many negative things in our mind and they actually don't come true to the magnitude. Now here I am talking to Frank DeAngelis on April, you know, 20th, 1999. Fears happen at the highest magnitude possible. So when you hear me say that and you hear me talk about that with other people in the past, what, what comes to mind? What are your thoughts? Boy, that fear, it was something you never envisioned. And I think you always try to think the best of things and situations, and you always think it's going to happen to others, but not to, not here. And right. in the reality of that day, and as I tell people, if you would have told me a call might could happen at column, I'd have said no. And the biggest fear that I had, you know, as a teacher, as a coach, as a parent, a grandparent, you want to do whatever you can to make a good life for your kids. And I think as educators, you know, we want to do the very best of preparing them. And then when these violent acts right now, if you would have asked me this question on April 18th of 1999, I, I don't know what my fears would have been. But yeah. now, every day, my fear is when I see my granddaughter, I don't want her to be in a situation like those poor kids at Sandy Hook or hiding underneath a table like yeah. Ireland and that's my biggest fear now but I truly believe as I, I refuse to live by fear I don't want to be helpless and hopeless 
But I think a lot of times with these people that create these acts of terrorism, you look at the people in 9-11, they, they wanted any person that got on a plane to be second guessing is a city. Right. Those two killers from Columbine, from some of their journal entries, they wanted to make sure that every kid that walked into that school, there was a potential that another Columbine could happen. And I don't want that. You know, I don't, I don't want that to happen. Yeah. And we just got to reassure. And, you know, one of the things I tell people all the time, you know, I mentioned earlier in this podcast that my parents are still alive, but if they had to bury me and I'm 65 years old, it would be tough because I was their kid. Sure. And in our lives, we're not supposed to bury our kids. And, you know, we got to do everything possible. And if I could reach out to your audience, you know, people ask, what are you going to do? I said, what are we going to do? all of our kids and we need to come together and enough is enough we just can't yep. continue down this path today and you've mentioned it numerous times but you know you, you think about faith and you think about faith in our public you know education system in the world we live in and we don't have to make it about that at all i'm not saying that but how important was your faith how important was the faith amongst that community amongst those kids in that school what role did that play going forward you know, it's real interesting, and I've heard this quote so many times, uh, you know, there's not an atheist in a foxhole. Hmm. And I think back to Columbine, I think back to 9-11, and I saw more people at churches. You know, the interfaith community opened its doors, and it gave people hope. It gave people answers when sometimes there were not. And Again, not trying to convert, but it gave that hope. And, you know, from a personal standpoint, I know what it did for me and so yeah. many students. There's a young lady who was not a person of faith, and she was supposed to be in the library that day. Every day throughout that semester, she's usually in the library studying for her next class. For whatever reason, she decided to go out to lunch. And she went out to lunch. It saved her life. Well, after that, she decided to become a nun. And oh my gosh. And she is now a nun. And talk about an emotional time. I was just in Pittsburgh this past fall and she was in the audience and in her heaven. And I just start crying. And she shared her story saying that that day, for whatever reason, I was not in that library and it wasn't by accident. And she became a person of faith. And now she's out sharing her story and helping others. So you hear so many stories like that. No, no different than that key was not, uh, that was not Frank's lucky draw. It's just, uh, you just accept it. And, you know, when, where, where it hurts is because 13 lost their lives. And you can't explain that. But so many of those families um, that lost their children were people of faith. Yeah. You know, they continue to believe that. And, you know, and they're preaching that. And, and I was amazed if you ever go out to the Columbine Memorial, and, and this is not to self-promote, but I came out with a book uh, back in last March, and it's called They Call Me Mr. D. And it's the story of Columbine's heart, resilience, and recovery. And it talks about this journey and all the proceeds and, that I'm making from the book are going to the Columbine Permit Memorial. And Tommy, it was such an honor. I think so much of this man, uh, he wrote the foreword for that book. But what in the back of that book we took all the writings from the 13 kids because all their parents wrote a blurb about them and the reason i'm sharing this is because we're talking about the faith in probably 90 percent of the writings all of their parents of the kids who lost their lives faith was an important part of their lives mm. and there were staff or there were students who lost their life because they said yes i believe in jesus christ and the word was not now you're going to meet your maker and, and, you know, that's one of the things, being a person of faith, and I, this has crossed my mind several times, and I've done some Bible studies. I don't know what I would have said that day. I'm hoping that I would have said, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. But I don't know until you're put in that situation. Right. You know? and, and you just got to believe in, uh, you know, the thing that I talked about earlier, live by faith and not by sight. And I think one of the things that alleviates that fear is the fact that and I can remember sending Tommy this today that, you know, I have it here on my desk. I have the strength to face all the conditions by the power that Jesus gives me. And I said, Tommy, isn't that a good feeling that 
we don't have to worry because we're going to be taken care of. And it just helps us lead that way. And people are saying, you don't really, you don't work. And I said, if I, if I believe in God, he's going to take care of us. Right. We'll be there every step of the way. He hasn't let me go. Well, Frank, thank you so much for sharing your story. I wish I could give you a big hug and thank you. You can feel your passion. You can feel your leadership and uh, you can feel that you're a great man. And uh, Columbine is, is and was very lucky to have a man like you. Thank you. And I hope we'll get to meet you in person. Amen. Well, thank thanks you. for being with me. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.